I have two important messages to share today. I'm joined by the Deputy Prime Minister, who in a moment will share details of additional financial support to help business through the accelerating Omicron outbreak. But first, I wish to speak as frankly as I can about where we are at currently in our fight against COVID-19 and also where we are going. After two long years, we are now in the position where COVID has reached our shores in a widespread way. Our seven-day average for cases is 1,667, and we are predicting cases will continue to double every three to four days. It's likely then that very soon we will all know people who have COVID, or we will potentially get it ourselves. There was a time when that was a scary prospect, but it doesn't have to be now, and that's for three reasons. Firstly, we are highly vaccinated, and that happened before Omicron set in. Secondly, our high vaccination coverage means COVID will be a mild to moderate illness for most people. And if you're boosted, you are 10 times less likely to end up in hospital. Thirdly, even though for some people COVID will still be more severe, we're using public health measures like masks, gathering limits, and vaccine passes to slow down the spread to ensure there is a hospital bed for everyone who needs it. So far, that plan is working. We have 46 cases per 100,000 people compared to 367 in New South Wales and 664 in Victoria at the same point in the outbreak. Our hospitalisations too are well below Australian states at a similar time. That all means that our healthcare system can continue to keep people safe so, if someone has a heart attack tonight, the ambulance will arrive and take them to a hospital with a free bed. And that is thanks to everyone who has stayed the course, despite it being so incredibly hard at times. But what comes next? Our primary goal is to manage COVID with as few restrictions on our daily lives as possible, to keep people feeling confident and safe, and to accelerate our economic recovery. As always, what that means in terms of changing restrictions isn't an easy question to answer in an often unpredictable pandemic. But by looking at what is happening overseas, we can begin to look to the future. Firstly, we know our wave of cases is likely to hit a peak in roughly mid to late March, only three to six weeks away. At that point, if we follow the pattern of other countries, we'll likely see a rapid decline, followed by cases stabilising at a lower level. That is the point when we can start to do things differently. First, the traffic light system will change. The COVID protection framework is built to keep our hospitals and wider health system running. Once we come out the other side of the peak, it will be clearer that we've reached our high point and that we have managed it, that our hospitals have managed, and we can begin to ease the public health measures that did their job in slowing the wave down. And so we'll be able to look at moving through the traffic lights, easing off the gathering limits, for instance. But we also employed extra tools like vaccine passes in the face of Delta and Omicron. As we have always said, these were necessary if we hadn't had vaccine passes as we managed Delta, we would have had to instead use more general restrictions across the whole population. They have always been the least bad option. But while they have been necessary, as I've always said, they've also been temporary. Vaccine passes were a way of ensuring that within the relatively free system of the traffic lights, that people who were in high risk places had some layer of protection. But once we come through a wave and a peak of Omicron, that equation changes because many unvaccinated people at that point will have been exposed to COVID-19. Put simply, the reason we will be able to move away from vaccine passes and many mandates is because more people will have had COVID. So in the same way that coming out the other side of the peak will give us a chance to step down through the traffic light system and ease things like gathering limits. It will also enable us to move on from vaccine passes 
and ease mandates in places where they are less likely to impact on vulnerable people. They will remain important in some areas, though, for some time. There can be no specific date given at this point, but what I can tell you is that we'll be looking to make sure that we are well beyond the peak and that the pressure on our health system is manageable. Some might ask, why not do away with the traffic light system entirely? The first answer is new variants and potential future waves for which we must remain prepared. And the second is that we will go through our first winter with COVID at the same time that flu returns, following two winters of very low rates. So as our borders open, we approach winter with the potential of more illness. We need to ensure our health system can manage a heavier burden as well. To summarise then, the coming weeks, COVID will increase and rapidly. There will be disruption and pressure from Omicron. We must brace through the next six, six weeks, but we can do so knowing a future with fewer restrictions is near because that has always been the course we have charted. We've stopped using lockdowns. Our borders reopened to Kiwis in Australia in a week. We progressively keep, keep on opening. Our use of MIQ, which has helped us so much, will change dramatically. And as we reach that peak and start to come down, we can start to move towards a life that feels a little more like a new normal that we can all live with. 2022 is about moving forward. New Zealand is in demand internationally. And again, our primary goal is to manage COVID with as few restrictions and accelerate our economic recovery while continuing to ensure that lives and livelihoods are protected. And while everything I have said today has been directed to every New Zealander who is anxious about the future, either because they're afraid or because they just want COVID to be over, I'll leave this final message for those occupying the lawns of Parliament. Everyone is over COVID. No one wants to live with rules or restrictions. But had we not all been willing to work together to protect one another, then we all would have been worse off as individuals, including losing people we love. That hasn't happened here for the most part, and that is a fact worth celebrating rather than protesting. We all want to go back to the way that life was, and we will, I suspect sooner than you think. But when that happens, it will be because easing restrictions won't compromise the lives of thousands of people, not because you demanded it. Now is not the time to dismantle our hard work and preparation to remove our armour just as the battle begins. I'll now hand over to Minister Robertson, who will set out new economic supports for businesses who have been affected by Omicron. Thank you, Prime Minister. Nanhi nui ke koutou katoa. When the government made the hard decisions in 2020 and 2021 to put New Zealand into lockdown, it was clear that we needed to put in place broad-based financial support to help our workers and businesses get through. Since the beginning of the pandemic almost two years ago, the government has paid out almost $23 billion in support via the wage subsidy scheme, the resurgent support payment and the small business cash flow loan scheme. Taking into account other related support, more than $25 billion worth of income and financial support has been paid out since the onset of COVID-19. This has contributed to the New Zealand economy performing better than many of the countries we compare ourselves to and ahead of our forecasts. Throughout the pandemic, we have been monitoring our support schemes and adapting them to fit with the changing impacts of the pandemic and the needs of businesses and workers. As I said back in October when we announced the traffic light system, the government has been monitoring the impact of the new framework on businesses and the economy. Overall activity in the economy has remained strong as most businesses are able to operate with only limited restrictions. This reinforces the decision not to have across the board financial support like the wage subsidy scheme available during the COVID protection framework. However, for some sectors there has been a significant decline. The latest retail card data that we have shows that spending on food and beverage services, art and recreation services and accommodation all fell further compared with the same week in 2020, down 27%, 47% and 59% respectively. When we created the COVID protection framework, we were clear that it was still possible for people to travel, eat out and go to bars, albeit with restrictions. 
It was not possible to predict how people would behave under the settings or as Omicron took hold. A combination of the gathering restrictions, particularly in hospitality, and people's behavioural responses has seen an impact that may cause some viable businesses to cease to be able to operate. Therefore, we have to act. We have looked closely at how best to target this support. We have created some bespoke packages for the arts and events sectors. However, doing the same for hospitality or accommodation runs into significant definitional and integrity issues. In order to provide targeted support, we have decided to use a revenue drop figure that is higher than we previously had in place, and there will be declarations required to link the revenue drop to the impact of the COVID protection framework and the spread of Omicron. A new payment has been created, the COVID support payment, which is similar to the former resurgence support payment. The COVID support payment will be $4,000 per business plus $400 per full-time employee capped at 50 FTEs or $24,000. This is the same calculation as we used for the transition support payment just before Christmas. Applications for the first payment will open on the 28th of February with payments starting from the 1st of March. It will be available on a fortnightly basis for six weeks, so three payments in total. We believe that this will get people through the worst of the Omicron outbreak, but as I've said, we constantly monitor the situation and we do have the option to extend this if necessary. Like the resurgence support payment, there are criteria. Firms must show a 40% drop in seven consecutive days within the six weeks prior to the shift to phase two of the Omicron response on the 15th of February. As before, there will be exceptions for seasonal businesses. The revenue drop test is the most effective way to target support to where it is needed most. It captures the businesses within specific sectors that are the most affected and by proxy targets particular sectors over those less affected. The Treasury estimates that the cost of each payment will be between $160 and $260 million. I'm also announcing today that we are making changes to the Small Business Cash Flow Loan Scheme to increase the amount of funding available to eligible businesses through a new top-up loan. The top-up loan will allow those firms that have already accessed a loan to draw down an additional $10,000 with a new repayment period of five years and the first two years being interest-free as they are now. Cabinet has also agreed to remove the first two years of accrued base interest from all borrowers who have or will take out a loan under the scheme. This change will mean that interest will only start accruing at the beginning of year three. These changes will come into effect in about four weeks. Finally, we are also extending inland revenues flexibility for tax payments to assist firms with cash flow pressures. This means that if a business is struggling to pay its tax in full or on time because of COVID-19, it can pay it off over time simply by setting up an instalment arrangement in their MyIR account. Inland Revenue has also has existing discretions for providing financial relief for customers that have been unable to pay their tax on time. I strongly encourage businesses struggling to pay tax because of the impacts of COVID to communicate with Inland Revenue to see if they could delay starting payments to a later date or if any part of their tax could be written off. Inland Revenue can help with both GST and provisional tax uh, payments. We have sufficient resources in the COVID Response and Recovery Fund to cover the costs of these announcements. However, we have taken the precaution of topping the fund up by $5 billion to cover for other expenditure that is expected in particular to support the health response to Omicron, including the purchase of vaccines, antiviral drugs, and the ongoing support for increasing the capacity of the health system. As we previously said, the money will only be spent when it is needed. We have the resources to do this because the economy continues to outperform expectations and our levels of debt remain below forecast and relatively low compared to the rest of the world. I want to finish by reiterating something that the Prime Minister has said. We know from the international experience that Omicron cases rise rapidly, but then hit a peak from after around four to six weeks, and then they drop off. We also know that consumer demand tends to pick up very quickly. Under our settings of the COVID protection framework, people can continue to go out, shop and travel. And our Reconnecting New Zealand framework will see the borders progressively more open. So my message to the business community is that we are providing temporary support to get through this phase but there is every reason to be confident that this will pass relatively quickly and businesses will be able to operate normally as they have done for extended periods over the last two years. Prime Minister. Lauren. Lauren. Thank you. Prime Minister. For two weeks, people haven't been able to move around our capital city. Why not give a date for when mandates will end? 
We've given a very clear indication here today that firstly, we'll be looking to do that when it is safe to do so. But all of the evidence is suggesting, and our experts, that once we come down off the other side of a peak and we know our hospitals have coped, and frankly, unfortunately, more of those unvaccinated individuals will have been exposed to COVID, that means we're less likely to need vaccine passes and mandates. And that is when it will be safe to start removing them. Do you have confidence in the police, Commissioner? Yes, I do. And I've expressed confidence, of course, in the enormous job and very difficult job that the police do on our behalf every day, including on the forecourt of Parliament right now. Uh, that doesn't mean necessarily that every single decision that's made there will be broad agreement with, but that does not change my absolute support for the police force. You've got a situation where people can't move around the capital city. Who is responsible for that and for doing something? Well, when it comes to the enforcement of the law, there is absolute clarity that that is a decision for the police, and, and that is for very good reason. You've got to have the independence of the police, or people will, of course, lose faith if you ever have politicians interfering with decisions around charging and arresting citizens. That has to lay with them. Uh, yeah, Jen. Yeah. Sorry, do you believe police could have acted sooner then? Yeah. Ultimately, the thing that will resolve uh, what is occurring out on our forecourt right now and in the centre of Wellington and obstructing business, passers-by, school children, will be protesters leaving. So let's be really clear on where the responsibility now sits for resolving this situation. There will be a time when we'll have the opportunity to cast back and learn from this situation. But right now, my message would be a simple one. Uh, the protesters have made their point. It is time for them to leave. You've, you've said that this is not, um, your, your, your speech today wasn't a response to the demands Absolutely of the protesters. Absolutely not. But with the opposition parties taking a more sympathetic view to what the protesters uh, advocating for, have you felt pressure to respond to those protesters' demands? Well, what I feel is a responsibility to keep New Zealanders safe through this pandemic, but to continue to ease uh, all of the restrictions as it is safe to do so. And we're getting a very clear indication based on what we're seeing internationally on when we believe that will be able to occur. But I can tell you, it's not as you're on the upside of a growing outbreak. It's when you come down that it'll be safe to do that. And look, to the opposition, I would say, we all took as parties a position, rightly so, that none of us would engage with what is ultimately illegal activity outside that borders on and demonstrates bullying and harassment of Wellingtonian. Uh, I find uh, their position at the moment uh, quite upsetting to see now they seem to be responding and sympathising with the protesters. They've had human waste thrown at them this morning. How disgusting is that behaviour? You know, I, I grew up in a police police family, uh, and so that is why I feel like I have a real appreciation of the difficult job that police officers do on our behalf day in, day out. No one should have to face having human waste thrown at them while they're just trying to keep people safe. Prime Minister, yeah. uh, you mentioned a period of six weeks uh, early on. Is that yeah. the period that you would be able to tell the protesters if you had talked to them uh, that they could be looking at the removal of mandates. So what I've set out today is based on modelling and overseas experience as a view that in three to six weeks we'll likely see that peak. And what we'll then be looking for is a clear indication that we are on the other side of it, that hospitalisation rates have normalised and our health system has demonstrated that it's been able to hold up against that higher caseload. That's when we'll be in a position to then safely start easing both things like gathering limits, but also moving away from things like vaccine passes. We've also been clear that the reason our experts believe that will be safe to do at that point is because so many more people, including, sadly, unvaccinated individuals, will have been exposed to COVID, which means it's a very different scenario than what we have now. Oh, so you didn't mention mandates there. Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah. mandates, mandates for similar reasons. I would just add, though, that the health advice that we're you know, receiving or the advice that you hear from experts is still a concern, though, around those really vulnerable communities that are served by the likes of certain parts of our health workforce. So I'll be looking to get more advice on that. But there are other mandates that I believe, yes, we will be in a position to remove at that time. What would be so wrong, and you now may be taking a step back, 
and meeting with at least a delegation of uh, protesters from the front. On line. the day that protesters have thrown human waste at police as they have sought to simply bring law and order to Wellington and allow Wellingtonians to move around the city, the suggestion that we would then engage with that kind of behaviour, I just reject. My responsibility is to speak to all New Zealanders and they all deserve to hear what we believe our forward plan will look like in the coming weeks. Right now, the focus has to be on getting us through this outbreak safely and looking to changes once we're out the other side. Yeah, look. Um, a question for you, maybe, um, Mr. Robertson. Have you looked at um, cutting off funding streams to the uh, occupiers out there? I mean, I know yeah. that in the US, oh, sorry, in, the, in Canada, there were yeah. some emergency powers passed. What do we know about it? And yeah. are you looking at doing anything about it? Yeah, and look, ultimately, I think the first thing I'd say is those decisions would sit with um, the police. They'd have both the ability to investigate and then enforce. Uh, what we've um, seen at this stage has been, has been more anecdotal than hard evidence around the connection to overseas protest. Uh, but what we have all observed is that there's something in the order of up to 25 countries who are experiencing this kind of activity right now. New Zealand is not alone. Uh, in what we're seeing here, uh, and there has been, of course, and you will have all observed yourself, uh, elements of international influence. And that's not just being flag flying, but some of the messaging and misinformation and disinformation. But ultimately, the decisions on pursuing or identifying whether or not there's particular sources of funding that should be focused on, that would still be a matter for the police. So, this is a this is as you say this is a global issue. Other, it is global. Other, other nations have taken a legislative path. Is that something that you would be open to? Were it necessary? Again, I think really we'd want to take some advice there um, before determining what needs to be done. Understanding whether or not those tools are available in an adequate way here, and actually understanding what is occurring here at the moment. As I say, you can observe it. You can see it in the messaging. A bit of anecdata being shared, but we'd want to see the evidence to ensure that we were, that any steps or uh, regulatory changes were actually targeted at, at the identified problem that's, that exists. Prime Minister, Prime Minister, you, um, Jason, then Prime Minister, you um, painted a little bit of a picture about what life would be like after the peak um, and yeah. into the future. Mm. Are you able to give us any sort of insight as if to it's going to be a movement down the traffic light system or will it be a move to another stage system or will yeah. it be back to life as we knew it um, yeah. in 2019? Yes, so what we would expect at this stage, and again we're casting forward, but you'll already have seen that the traffic light system already has all of the criteria that I've talked to. It's all about uh, our health system's ability to cope with the cases we have. It's not uh, it's not based simply on community transmission and cases. That was our old way of managing COVID. Our new way very much looks on health system impacts, and there's a simple reason for that. If our health system can cope, everyone gets better health care, whether you've got COVID or whether or not you've had a stroke or a heart attack or a car accident, and that's what we all want. So we'll have a much better idea of our ability to cope with those higher levels once we come off the back of the peak that will enable us then to progressively move through back through the system. The one uh, change in settings I'm suggesting today is that because of that widespread exposure to COVID, vaccine passes will likely be able to then be removed as part of that move down the stages. So you're saying that we would see a return Not to orange then to green? Yeah, and I absolutely expect that as we're able to and our health system is managing, we'll be able to do that. And keeping in mind then, actually, as you move through, things really ease up. But masks still are helpful, uh, and at different stages you have different gathering limits. But we all remember orange. It was a bit more normal than where we are now. So you're, expecting, you're expecting green to be the stock standard for New Zealand for the foreseeable? Yeah, well, green, of course, has many, many freedoms. It mirrors what we were used to with one, really. Um, and so I think that would be something people would be wanting to aspire to move back to. What I would just caution, of course, the Ministry of Health very, very you know, uh, I think responsibly, do want us to be cautious as we hit winter. Our borders are opening, flu will come in, that places pressure on our health system in any given year. We'll have Omicron that may peak, that may peak again, so we just need to make sure we've again got the ability to move through, but once we get through this first peak, vaccine passes are less likely to be necessary for those other outbreaks that we experience. Yeah, I'll see I'll just say I'll come to you. Oh, thank you. Can you confirm that thousands of tests will be dumped because of the backlog of 
been able to assist them. Mm. So after the five day period, can you confirm whether or not they will be dumped? No, that's not what I've been advised. Uh, what I've been advised is that there is an ability to move through um, some of the backlog in a way that should prevent that from happening. But what is, what is happening in Auckland today, because you'll see we have overall enough PCR capacity. The issue is we have a lot of tests being taken in one region. So uh, rapid antigen tests are being rolled out. We're replacing PCR in some of those surveillance areas to take some, put some extra capacity in. And at our community testing stations, you'll see rapid antigen tests used from today. We also expect them to start being used in GP clinics this week as well. And can, you also, can, can you also confirm um, that prisoners who have tested positive will be moving into isolation, segregation? You'll have to forgive me, I can't give you the exact protocols that corrections are using for COVID positive inmates. I do know that we have been experiencing cases in and around corrections, but if you don't mind, I'll ask them to respond to the protocols they use. Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Yeah, I'll come down, down here, Prime Mickey, and then um, Thank you. Amelia. Prime Minister, then, you said that mandates will remain important in some areas. In some areas. So will that be healthcare? Yes. What about in schools? Yeah, so at the moment, and again, this is where we do want to make sure that we have the ability to receive uh, based on the latest um, science and evidence, which of course is emerging still with Omicron, get the latest from our experts that the early indications are that it may be something you'd want to continue to use when you've got really vulnerable groups like particular parts of healthcare, but that there is the ability in other areas to move away from mandates. I do want to give them the space though to give us that formal consideration once we see more evidence. In consideration particularly for schools though, or do you already know one way or the other? We, we know, know that a particular mean? focus is, is healthcare settings and really vulnerable individuals. Uh, and so my expectation is that we'll see a, a real narrowing of where we use mandates again once we come through a peak, because in those cases, we'll see many more unvaccinated people who will have experienced COVID-19 by then. Parents may be concerned if mandates were to be removed from schools. And again, keep in mind, when we put them in place, very much it was because also there was the inability to vaccinate children. Uh, also, because we had what they call a naive population, a population that hasn't experienced COVID. The reality of Omicron is that with a large peak, many, many will experience COVID, including many of our unvaccinated people. So it does mean the reason and rationale for mandates in some areas, not all, in some areas does change. Prime Minister, Prime Minister, Prime Minister, Prime Minister, Prime Minister. Yeah, I'll come here, Joe, and then in the back here. Oh, sorry, I did say Amelia, I'm going to come to you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So just, just back to the testing. So the testing yeah. regime in Auckland has basically collapsed, un collapsed under the weight of cases. I, I wouldn't uh, agree with that. Um, but how concerned are you that people who should be getting tested aren't because of those wait times? So we have the capacity to proce uh, process uh, 35,000 or more PCR tests in any given day. My recollection is that we process somewhere in the order of 27,000 yesterday. The issue is we have a large number coming through in Auckland. That's why we, of course, have readied ourselves with rapid antigen tests are already in place in community testing stations and they are being used as of this week. But the, they ran out of rapid tests today. And I'm Sorry, I, I, I could not, I could not verify that that was necessarily the case. I'm only hearing um, your version. And, and the Secondary Schools Association... We do have oh, 4 million in distribution across New Zealand. So keeping in mind that pre-stocked across the country, there are 4 million rapid antigen tests right now. And the Secondary, uh, Secondary Principals Association says within a week, most Auckland high schools will be online learning only because of staff shortages. When will teachers get rapid tests? They already have them. Uh, I've been advised that up to 200,000 rapid antigen tests have been distributed across the country to enable schools to make a decision as to whether or not they would like to use those to allow um, teachers to return uh, to the school um, school grounds, even if they are a close contact. The Northland DHB is so short. Yeah. The Northland Sorry. DHB is so short on hospital beds that it's planning on using a field hospital when there's a rush of Omicron cases. Are you comfortable with COVID patients being treated in tents? I think I think keeping in mind that actually uh, it both in other countries we'd compare ourselves um, to, but also across our DHBs. 
they have been putting in place contingency plans to make sure uh, that we are, for instance, have enough physical space to triage people before they come into hospitals, space around EDs to make proper assessments in the safest way possible. So each DHB is undertaking that work. So that is, that is not unusual. That does mean in some places that either through commercial means, DHBs are acquiring additional shelter should they need to build those triage spaces, um, or they may well have sought the advice of the Defence Force. But uh, that is all part of our expectation of making sure that we have the right capacity should it be needed. Prime Minister, Prime Minister do you have Minister, you Joe. Um, Just a question for you and then a, a question for the Minister as well. If that's I'm sure he'll be delighted. <laughs> um, just you, you've used in several answers today that if the health system copes and talked about that normalisation um, of hospitals as well in terms of how you might be able to, to move to the next stage. How much will, um, whether the health system ends up being overwhelmed, we've obviously seen, even just in Australia, um, there's been quite an overwhelming in, in New South Wales and Victoria at times. How much would what happens with the health system, given we don't know what is going to happen, push out uh, any sort of changes you might have? Because that three to six period could be quite longer if there is... Yeah, and this is, and this is where we've given an indication, based on overseas, of what we've seen happen in peaks. Some countries have had prolonged peaks. That is true. And much of the difficulty here in making these judgments is because the world has not had Omicron for long. New Zealand indeed's only had it three to four weeks. So we're giving our, our best advice to New Zealanders about our direction of travel based on what we've seen overseas and based on what we're modeling. It's one of the reasons I, I just cannot give dates, but I can say once we are confident we are through the peak, and coming out the other side of it, and we're confident our health system has been able to cope and is coping again, that enables us to move away from some of those restrictions. But I guess the question there is that the number of cases and what's happening within the health system won't always necessarily match up, and you might have a situation where cases have started to come down, but the health system is still incredibly overwhelmed for any number of reasons, yep. and then heading into the flu season, say. Yes. So I guess when you were talking about that, and I know you're not putting a timeline on it, but is the likelihood that you, you could be pushed out by quite yeah. a few months? So the thing, the point that I'd make is that's probably more relevant for the movements around through the traffic light system than it is necessarily for changes like um, vaccine passes. Because remember, the reason our experts are saying that we'll be in a position once we come through the other side to move away things from things like vaccine passes is actually the level of exposure everyone would have had. So that's um, that's one of the factors that we'll be taking into account. But broad changes to our settings, you're right, will be about our health system. But we will be looking at both uh, in order to assess when the time is right. Hey, but I mean, if I may just clarify, I'm not sure whether or not your question was based on a, uh, um, a, a tweet by David Seymour, um, but the Ministry of Health has confirmed that no centres have run out of PCR test kits. Two centres um, briefly paused to adjust traffic management to take accounts of their rapid antigen test um, use. I imagine that might mean people are lingering for um, their use in those car parks. But they have since reopened and all um, community testing stations are open in Auckland and operating. It was yeah. based on one of our reporters going out sure. to one of the I'm testing stations. I'm happy to clarify that. that. We have not run out of PCRs. Minister, what uh, yeah, sorry, Joe. I did say that I'd give you one. Um, we talked last week about um, you wanting to see businesses keep have employees going out, staff, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of where we're at now, the next phase, does that change at all? Does your message change to people who are self-imposed lockdown or bosses are telling people not to go out? Does that change in terms of cases going up, the next phase, etc.? So the settings don't change. That's the important point. So we have, because we work so hard as a country to get vaccinated, to get boosted, because we do still have within those venues restrictions about distancing and mask wearing, we are in a position where people can continue to travel and go out and see their friends and, and eat out at a restaurant. Obviously, there are people who, who, for their own reasons, are going to decide they don't want to do that. What's important to me is that we emphasise that it is still safe to do that, but obviously people will come to their own conclusions. What we've recognised in this economic support package today is that when we look at the real data of what's happened under the red settings, we've got viable businesses who, whose existence, frankly, is at risk now. We don't want the scarring effect of that to occur, and so we can do both of these things at once, still have people safe to go out, but also provide support. Prime Minister, what do you think of the... Um Speaker's suggestion that 
uh, offence oh. around Parliament be investigated? Yeah, just for, to be clarity, this, this is not something that um, uh, ministers or indeed I don't believe it's something that the Parliamentary Services Commission have necessarily discussed at this stage. Uh, and so um, my view is that this is something that requires you know, full consideration of all parties in Parliament. Um, what I have no doubt of is the value in us undertaking an assessment in the aftermath of this experience around um, both the safety of the building but also the importance of ongoing accessibility. This is the people's house and I think people will want to make sure that we're balancing the need to keep the people who work here safe with also the need to ensure that people can access their democracy. So I've, I've seen no detailed plans so I have no particular view, just that it needs to be discussed by everyone. Prime Minister. Yeah. This afternoon, um, I mean, sorry, we'll flick over here to Ben and Justin. Yeah. This afternoon at the speech, National Leader Christopher Luxon said that you were missing in action. Do you have any direct response to that and do you think that his more recent commentary is stoking division? Well, I, certainly, as, as I've said, it did, uh, it did risk certainly um, uh, giving the impression of uh, sympathy towards those who, who have behaved, frankly, in a way that all Wellingtonians, um, I believe, would utterly reject. Um, as for the missing in action, I'll just let my presence here um, speak to that. And, of course, my media engagements this morning and my media engagements tomorrow and the next day and likely the next day. OK, Dean? Can I just quickly follow that before asking about self-isolation? Because previously, during outbreaks, you've, you've, you've had the 1 p.m.s, you've had Dr Bloomfield yeah. explain the science, done all the things. Yeah. Cases are higher than ever. There's going to be more death hospitalisations and, and upsettingly more deaths. Yeah. Are you planning on wheeling that back or not? Yeah. Uh, Look, well, one of the things that you know that we do is just have a look at whether or not when we are moving into different phases, whether or not we're, we're in the position to answer the questions of the day that may arise. And we will give a bit of consideration to how whether or not we're meeting all of those needs as we come through these next stages. For me, it is about making sure that we, A, are able to be held to account, but B, continue to provide reassurance um, if there are issues that arise that we're very publicly responding to those. Um, but, of course, we also often do like to hear the view of others as to whether or not there's something that are um, necessary. Can I also ask on, on self-isolation, because it feels like that's the um, piece of the puzzle we haven't given any clarity yet about when that will happen, either a timeline on when you provide the timeline or what the criteria need to be met. Before Close contacts or returnees? Before you get rid of self-isolation provision from returnees from ah, okay. abroad. Yes. So yeah. are you closer to making that determination, or is that just... Too hard, or it's too early. First thing, because I know this will be of interest to New Zealanders. Uh, just a reminder, of course, you'll see that we have been narrowing based on the evidence we have who we define as close contact. So it's getting to be a smaller group um, based on what we're seeing with onward transmission. When we hit phase three, which of course we did indicate somewhere in the order of 5,000 cases or thereabouts, we'd likely to move again to narrow to those who we would consider akin to household contacts. So that would mean fewer people would be caught by close contact provision. So I just thought I would make that clear for New Zealanders. For returnees, uh, we've already dropped it down to seven days. We've said that we believe it will likely reduce again. We are seeking advice from David Skegg's group um, on his view uh, on that question. And that's a group we've often used for some of our de decisions that relate to the border. You brought up David Skegg. He suggested you bring in a third booster shot as part of that fully vaccinated, uh, to, to be considered fully vaccinated, you know, to, to go to the gym, to use vaccine passes, all of those things. Is there a delay in doing that? Is there a reason? Is that for everyone or is that for, was that for returnees? No, he's suggesting, suggesting it should be part of the vaccine pass. Yeah, look, and I'm sure if um, he takes that view, he'll likely share that with us. But I also, um, my understanding is that he also is of the view that once you have greater exposure to COVID-19 in the community, that starts changing the equation for vaccine passes generally. Yeah. I'm I'm sure to to how concerned oh, yeah. are you by reports that the Muslim community in Indonesia was warning of a culture of racism and Islamophobia at Otago Girls, and no steps were taken before a student was assaulted two weeks ago? I look, I, I'm not privy to, um, to any individual issues that are being raised within um, the Dunedin community. Uh, but I think what we, are, what we have heard has happened here um, to a member of a school community uh, is absolutely appalling. Uh, and I'd like to think that all New Zealanders would take that view. 
uh, whether or not there were warnings within the school community or issues that have been raised, I can't speak to that, but I'd like to think if they were, that they would be heeded. We need to take seriously the safety uh, of members of our Muslim community, but particularly uh, those who are able to be easily identified. And that is an issue that has generally been raised as a concern, uh, both prior and in the aftermath of March 15. Both the principal and the board, though, yeah, I'll let you finish, Justin. just both the principal and the board have, have responded to this and have said that they have no further public comments to make and that any disciplinary actions won't be made public. There are calls for some type of public response. I thought that it had been publicly reported, but given you've claimed it hasn't been, I want to just be <laughs> cautious there and not being repeating something that hasn't been publicly reported, but I thought that it had. Mm. Um, Perhaps someone else could clarify that. Mark. On PCR test capacity, that, that figure you, you quoted 35,000 plus per day. Yes. Is that based on pooling samples? No. Remember the, the, uh, that is based on individualised. Because you remember our pooling took us up to about 60,000, but when you stop pooling, and that's off the top of my head, it's around 35,000. And have you received any advice on the sort of likelihood or chances that we do get a new variant post Omicron yeah. that. that uh, you know, requires a, a, a change in tack. Yeah. Yes, I think I think you'll see that uh, there is an undercurrent of concern globally that uh, we just cannot anticipate uh, what we may see, what we may see next. And so, what that means for us is, how do we then make sure that we are uh, easing and using the ability that we have to get back as much as possible to some level of normality, whilst keeping in some warning systems that will allow us to identify quickly and pivot quickly should we see a more dangerous variant um, that would be concerned for all of us arise. Much of those warning systems will need to be at the border and we're thinking about how we can integrate those, but in a way that also reduces the friction at the border. But that's part of what we're having to consider. Well, what are you yeah, well, Barry, and then I'll come back into Jason in the middle here and then over to Amelia. Forgive me, I have forgotten your name. I don't want to call you just the middle. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Barry. Uh, Prime Minister, you said earlier that the growing um, Omicron uh, issue is not a shouldn't be a scary prospect. Yeah. Do you think Omicron uh, is, in terms of um, fatalities, worse or better than the flu? Well, it is true to say that uh, in terms of uh, the experience that most will have, that it is more mild to moderate. So I don't think that that's where the debate lies. I think the issue is that COVID is in, is in a pandemic state. So the issue is the cumulative impact of people getting it all at once. And so that's where the real issue lies, making sure that you're able to properly manage that because if you're overwhelmed, people who otherwise might be able to be cared for properly through treatment miss out on that because of the pressure on the system. In terms of the flu, New Zealand uh, loses about 500 people a year. Yes, yes, and look, again, Barry, as I say, no one is arguing that Omicron is a more mild to moderate illness for most people, but again, it's a fact it's a pandemic. Uh, and that we have large numbers all at once. That is the area for concern and the cause um, for our health professionals, rightly, I believe, to want to ensure that we're protecting our health system and slowing it down. Just for the Minister um, yeah. of Finance. Um, Sorry, I did say I'd come into the Minister. Um, we've got the OCR decision coming up this week. We've had a number of economists come out and say that they're expecting a raise um, in, in that figure. Do you think this would put pressure on highly leveraged households that are already struggling? to see their mortgage rates go up if this does happen? Obviously, the first caveat is the one that I always make, which is I don't comment on um, the specific decisions that the Independent Monetary Policy Committee of the Reserve Bank make. However, the Reserve Bank have made the direction of travel uh, relatively clear. Uh, obviously, when interest rates rise, for some people that will see um, either both an immediate or in the near term a rise in what they have to pay back. I've consistently said that when people take on mortgage debt, they need to remember that the interest rate that they borrow it at may well and almost certainly will not be the rate that they end up paying back overall. So yes, there will be some families and some households where there will be some additional stress uh, put on them by this. Obviously, we hope that that is not widespread. How much of a concern for wider financial stability of New Zealand is this? Oh, look, you know, I mean, we have to bear in mind we're coming from very historically very low interest rates. And so what we you know where we are now is still well below where we have been on average for, for most of, of the last you know, decade or so. We have to make sure that as a country we are 
you know, support people who find themselves in financial stress, and we have many different ways of doing that. Uh, but overall, for the financial stability of New Zealand, I'm very confident in where the New Zealand economy is at. We have a very robust economy. It's continuing to operate well. Yeah, Excuse me, right here in the middle. Oh, thank you. Um, so you mentioned earlier, Prime Minister, that the, um, you'll be looking overseas, obviously, as we move through Omicron wave. Are there any particular mm. jurisdictions you are looking to at the moment? Mm. Actually, a, a quite a wide range. Uh, very helpfully, some of the analysis um, that I receive looks at both uh, those areas where we've already seen them come off the peak, those who are still uh, yet to reach theirs, and those that have plateaued. Uh, and one of the reasons is we're interested in whether or not there's anything particular that has caused those different patterns. Very hard to decipher why the different countries are having different experiences. Uh, and so that's why we do need to caveat what we're saying with it is early days for the world when it comes to Omicron, but when we come out the other side of the peak, this is what you can expect to see. Do you have anything else? Um, uh, yeah, just uh, follow up. Um, do you have any more detail when you're meeting with um, Sir David Skeggs group? No, that we tend to do, um, we tend to undertake uh, that advice on papers in between time. We might canvas with questions with the group from time to time, but um, we tend to get written ad advice. Um, and that goes through Minister Beryl. Yeah. Uh, Amelia, then I'm going to come down through. John, and I might finish over here, unless it was a, a bid, Luke, and then Luke. Yeah. Amelia. Yeah, just on the, on the COVID support scheme, so can, we, can we afford this? Can we afford another round of it? Absolutely. And as I said, we have enough money in the COVID Response and Recovery Fund to meet these costs. Uh, the temporary payments, uh, we're talking here about, you know, across six weeks. Um, I think they're important too, and, it, you know, bear in mind that our calculation is for a business of up to, to say, 20 people, this payment would be 50 nearly 60% of their fixed costs. So that's not even about meeting the basic costs that a business has, it's a contribution. Um, and I think it is important that we keep our small and medium enterprises healthy and functioning, but certainly from a fiscal point of view, yes, we can. And the other thing that businesses have told me that they need, specifically sort of tourism businesses, is they want certainty of the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. They want to know that tourists won't have to do that seven day isolation period. Can you give them the certainty that tourists coming into New Zealand when the border opens to them, that they won't be facing those lengthy isolation periods? Well, obviously, we've already outlined what happens with the Reconnect New Zealand plan, and for now, that isolation period is there. But as the Prime Minister has indicated just in an answer earlier, we're continually reviewing that. When the Prime Minister announced the reconnecting framework, she said that, and obviously it has reduced to seven days, and we want to see it reduced further mm. when it's safe to do so. So what I can assure those tourism operators is we're looking at this on a very regular basis, and as soon as we can, we will reduce it. The sweet spot we all want to find is our tourists being able to come in and experience a country with as few public health restrictions as possible, because we are managing we're moving into a new normal and our health system isn't overwhelmed and people feel confident and safe. So that's the constant balance we're looking to strike. Can I just quickly follow up on an earlier question? A little cheeky, Jenna. Sorry. How, how can you have confidence in the police commissioner I feel when like, he's effectively allowed I feel a like two-week siege of parliament? I feel like I've covered that off uh, in relatively uh, uh, large amount of detail, both this morning and this afternoon. But I am happy to reiterate... I have confidence in the police and our frontline police who have been doing a very tough job out there. That doesn't mean that I'll always agree or understand every operational decision that they take, but we're very clear that those operational decisions will always be for them. You would never want a country where politicians are instructing the police on how to enforce the law. So what specific Sorry, operational okay, decision then? Um, what is your response to Victoria University students who are frustrated with being unable to study on their campus due to protests you've refused to engage with? Perhaps this is a local oh. member of parliament or hand to the Deputy Prime well, Minister. Well, the, the thing I would uh, say is that I sympathise or empathise greatly with them. Uh, and this is, as the Prime Minister said earlier, in the hands of those protesters to having made their point to leave, to allow the likes of students from Victoria University to be able to get on with their lives. Um, the university ultimately has to make the decisions that it makes around the safety of the people who are in their charge. They have made those decisions, um, particularly with reference to the Pipitea campus. Uh, but unfortunately, university students arriving for the new year were some of the people who were yesterday subject to abuse and harassment simply for wearing a mask. And so I would say to those people, I, I'm very sorry that that is the case. Um, you know, we want this to end as soon as possible. 
uh, the enforcement of the law remains in the hands of the police. Okay, Prime I'm going to come to John, and then I'm going to finish up with Luke. The um, protest occupation in campsite area has some very interesting attractions, yoga, free food, music. It seems a lot of people in the crowd at any time, apart from being children, are curious observers or, or onlookers. Um, so what is your message to those people who might be there as day trippers or curious onlookers? Are they unintentionally emboldening emboldening more extreme elements in the crowd. My message would be very simple, do not attend. Do not attend. Uh, and uh, you will have seen some of the signage that is down on that forecourt that I would like to think uh, would offend most New Zealanders. And so whilst some may simply be interested, uh, I think they wouldn't want to send a message of support for some of the messaging that we've seen down there. Do not attend. Uh, the police are trying and working very hard to enforce a barricade around the outside. I'm sure you would not want to make their job any harder. Prime Minister, if I may, to, um, also I'd ask those people to think of the businesses in the area, uh, the students that we referenced before, uh, those students who are just trying to go to school uh, in the local schools here. I'd say to those people, if, if you're here because you're curious, think about the level of disruption that has been caused to all of those people and the harassment that those people are currently receiving. On, on available intelligence, um, what percentage of the crowd do you think would be counted among the category of... Yeah, I look over. I, you know, that's not something can, I'm, I'm in a position to make um, any statement over. Um, what I do know is that there are a range of groups out there um, that has been made clear by the letters that they have produced, listing the different groups that are represented. And I would remind people that in their letter, they demanded that all of the protections that we currently have in place to slow down the pandemic, they wish to have removed. And I believe the majority of New Zealanders would disagree with that. I do not for a moment think that differences in opinion mean that we are divided as a nation. And I absolutely reject that. And I don't believe that that is what we have on display now. Okay, I'll just, just say finish with look. Uh, just a quick one for um, Grant Robinson. Obviously this new payment's starting off at six weeks, um, based on the back of what you said, you know, you should consumer spending, based on overseas, up, you know, it ticks back mm. up quite quickly. Um, you know, you're really prepared to extend that further if, if the uptick doesn't, doesn't occur? How are you sort of... Yeah. Well, well, not just cases, it's human behaviour. Yeah, as we said, and as I said in my introductory remarks, um, we have the ability to do that, but we do believe that the experience overseas is a pretty good indication. New South Wales in particular, we've got good data there about what happened after that sort of six-week period and as things come off their peak. As the Prime Minister said, it's not just about cases, it is about the way people react to that. We know from the time uh, that New Zealand has spent in lockdown that there's only a certain length of time people will do that. Uh, and so we're very confident that we will see that come back. But yes, to answer your question, the facility is there to extend it should we need to. Okay, Minister, thank you very much, much you everyone. Very quickly, you mentioned the businesses. Has any um, thought been given to yeah, support for the businesses? <laughs> support for the businesses that are affected by the protest. So um, a number of them will be eligible for what we've announced today anyway, and I've um, been talking to uh, the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment and also the Wellington City Council about what might be possible for those businesses. Don't have a resolution on that yet, but a number of them will be eligible for this payment. Okay,